Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, how y'all doing? Good. 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 Um, this, this is like the, uh, the final session we're having as far as the, um, the Swagify uh, project. Uh, for those that are not familiar, um, the Indugu Business and Leadership Academy partnered with the VCU African American Studies program to launch what was called Swagify. Um, it's a program that was uh, started to teach young people uh, about financial literacy and the importance of it. So we had four different sessions where you know, we taught different concepts. Um, so now this is like the, the final session where you all took the final test. And we just wanted to kind of celebrate and have, you know, get y'all down to the Mama J's of locally owned uh, black business um, that's been here for quite some time and very successful. Um, and we also brought out some of our special guests here to kind of speak to you all to answer some questions um, that you all may have in regards to leadership or financial literacy. Um, we have a gentleman here, Reggie Ford. Um, he's the, uh, the president of the Richmond Crusader Voters, as well as a, uh, a key member of the local Toastmasters organization. Uh, we also have the brother here, Vincent Ellis. Um, he's the founder and owner of VEW Enterprises. Uh, he's a, a well-known author, and a, as well as a, uh, a playwright. Isn't that correct? Right. And again, he's going to speak about his experience. And then finally, we have Reverend uh, Michael Hathaway. And Sean, if you want to get some back yeah. uh, so much we can say about him, but Mike Hathaway is a native of uh, Richmond, Virginia. He grew up right here in Northside. Um, he is a uh, pastor of New Generation International Ministry. He's also an entrepreneur, owns several businesses, um, also has a wealth, um, wealth academy that he runs. And um, I'll let him get more into his story when, when you all uh, when when they talk to you all. So we're just glad that um, you all could be here on today uh, again to celebrate. You know, I know it's been a long time since we've seen each other, about three months. Um, but just glad to see you all and uh, celebrate on this day. All right. Thing called mortgages. Anybody know what mortgage is? Absolutely. So most people who, who don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank, they have to come to, the, to a bank and borrow some money. So that is what I do. But what's passionate with me is talking to young people, older people as well, about our right to, to vote. I'm, I'm also the president of the Richmond Crusade Voters. And I'm also district directors of Toastmasters, and I'll explain both of those to you in a moment. But the thing that's passionate with me about, about voting is there are a lot of people who lost their lives and a lot of bloodshed and tears, so we have the opportunity to go out and vote. And I think we need to start that with, with young people. When I was in high school, my teachers took me to the Urban League, and I was a little young boy, and didn't know anything about voting, anything about the Urban League, but I wanted to. I went and I was just, just acting crazy, wasn't paying attention. But as I got older, started sticking with me, and I wanted to say, where did this passion for politics come in? And it was because of what Kerwin and the rest of the crew were doing here. I was in a program similar to what you all are doing, and it gave me some direction. I didn't think it was doing anything at the time, but it, it, it later on, it, it manifested, it came to fruition. And so I, I, I say that because really embrace the things that you are learning here and, and, and the, the, hear the rest of these brothers speak about their opportunities and things that they've done. The reason politics stuck with me, other than my teacher taking me there, everything that you do, when you get out of school, what time you go to school, everything is political. We have people that vote on it. At the General Assembly, they go in from January to March, the third to sixth day, depending on what year, what year it is. And they vote on what time you get out of school, when you go to school. They, they vote on uh, simple things that you have to turn your lights on when you have your windshield wipers on. So. Attention? Yeah, I just want to make sure. Um, I'm happy to be here today, and I'll make, try to make mine short and sweet as well. Um, I grew up right here in Richmond, Virginia, born and raised um, on the south, in the south side area. 
Um, also migrated between Southside, Chesterfield, and uh, Western area. Um, I grew up with a father that was incarcerated. Um, he was in jail for, me, for the majority of my life, and I was raised by my mom and my grandma. So very close with my mom and grandma. I think I spoke with one of y'all earlier talking about your mom's cooking. Um, I, I definitely uh, can agree with you on that. I was very, very close with the women that was in my life because they were the ones that stuck by me when, when nobody else was there. Um, and so having a father that was incarcerated, I didn't have a man that was in the home to, to discipline me and tell me the different things to do and not do, uh, show me certain ways of how to become a man. So I started getting into trouble, um, you know, stealing, fighting, and doing all kind of things that would land you in jail just like he was. And I despised him for being in jail and not being there for me, but the direction and path that I was going, I would have ended up just like him. Um, but having a strong mother and grandmother, they kept me in the church. They kept, you know, instilling positive things in my life, as well as, um, you know, they, they didn't bad mouth, you know, the father that I knew. But what I found out at the age of 16 was that my mom sat me down and said that he's not your biological father. And I thought he was my birth father my entire life. You know, he was in jail, in out of jail. I loved him. I thought he was my father. Um, and I found out at the age of 16. So that was right around 11th grade. So I'm in high school, uh, I was at Meadowbrook High School. So I was in high school doing my thing like you all are doing. And all of a sudden, one regular evening at home, my mom hit a, dropped a bomb on me and said, that's not your biological father. Um, and that turned my world upside down. I was already stealing and doing all the stuff I told you about, but everything turned up another notch when I found out that news. Um, and me and my mom were having some, some difficulties because I didn't trust her. Um, when she you know, shared with me that she had lied to me about that, serious matter. So I went on a quest to try to find my father, um, as well as I'm going through high school. So I graduated, I went to Norfolk State, uh, got my undergrad degree, and at the age of 21, I changed my name because the name that I carried all the way up until 21 was the name of the guy that I thought was my father. So not only did I think it was my father, everybody had me believe in that, but I actually had his name as well. So I found out at 16, that wasn't my dad. Once I turned an adult, I went and changed my name to the a middle and last name, Vincent Ellis White, because I identified with my family, the Ellis White, um, that family. So at age 21, I still hadn't found my dad. I was still dealing with some identity issues. I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't know who to identify with as far as what family, who was my blood. But I was, I was, I was uh, covering that because I didn't want everybody to know that I was dealing with that. I call that wearing a mask, masking. So I was 21, I was doing well in school. Um, I had avoided jail in the sense of like with the path I was going towards. Um, but I just, I didn't feel complete. And it wasn't until later on in my adult life that I ended up actually finding my biological father. And my biological father and I connected. Um, and it's a whole story behind that, that um, I ended up taking that, that bad situation or that, that unfamiliar situation and turning that into good to where I sat down and wrote down my life story, and I called it Finding Chris, My Father. His name was Chris Anderson. So a lot of people told me I wouldn't be able to write that story. I never took any writing classes. I just was an okay student in English and in writing, but I felt a higher calling on me to write that book. So I wrote about my journey, not knowing my dad, having an incarcerated father, uh, beefing with my mom, fighting, stealing. I, got, I, went, I sat in jail for a little while, too. Um, I wrote about my story. I called it Finding Chris, My Father. And I only wrote it for me to be able to uh, be, it be therapeutic to help me out to be able to write it. But the story ended up taking off, and I went on NBC, ABC, started doing speaking engagements, and the book did very well. And I met these two brothers that told me they wanted to turn it into a uh, stage play. So we turned it into a stage play, and the stage play started traveling. Um, I went to New York with it. Uh, I was on ABC in New York. And the story started taking off, and what I found out was that a lot of brothers just like you were dealing with the same thing that I was dealing with. And I thought my story was so unique, but I found out that a lot of brothers that was coming to my play, they were talking to me, that were of your very same age, were telling me, coming to the side saying, I don't have my father, or I'm dealing with the same thing. Sometimes their mother wasn't there, but I was able to kind of break down those walls and, and be able to have these um, sometimes awkward or uncomfortable conversations because we all shared a similarity. But I was also showing as a uh, representation that there is hope and you can still get through life. You can still be great. You can still do great things if you can persevere. If you can partner up with people like this and, and have mentors and connect. And that way when you find yourself struggling 
or worried, worry, you know, concerned with everything, you can come to some brothers, some elders, and they can help you out. And now where I am is I have my own business, uh, VW Enterprises. I also work for the city of Richmond um, for the Department of Social Services. I also act. I've been in independent films that's coming out this summer. Um, I also was an uh, executive producer on a TV show that was on Fox every Saturday called The Heart. It just had the finale on May 9th. Um, I do keynote speaking around the nation, and I get paid to do the keynote speaking. So a lot of these things that I've dealt with that I always thought was a, um, something I wanted to hide, and I didn't want to tell everybody. I was angry, and I was mad, and I was confused. I turned all those things around, and now I go back and I speak to people like you all, um, and then I'm able to help you all, as well as I'm able to make a living out of it, too. So you can turn, whatever you're dealing with right now, you can turn those things around and turn it into something positive, as long as you believe and stay strong. All right? That's it. What's up? And um, my name is Mike Hathaway. I was born and raised in Northside, Richmond, right on Haynes Avenue. Um, I spent all of my educational career uh, there in Northside and lived there my entire life. Um, I'm married. I got six kids. Um, and I can date back, uh, and I also pastor a church right on Chamberlain Avenue, once again, back in Northside. But I pastor a church right on Chamberlain Avenue. We just opened up a community center um, right here on Chamberlain Avenue. Now, I'm also an entrepreneur. I have a, a number of different businesses. I um, own a car dealership and a finance company that goes with my car dealership. Um, we're opening up a daycare right on Chamberlain Avenue. Um, and we got a couple other businesses that we're working on. I'm very, very, very so much um, entrepreneurial because of the level of exposure um, that I had in my life as a child. My mother used to take me to settings like this. Mm -hmm. um, she was uh, she retired from VCU, and one of her best friends was uh, head of the African American Studies at VCU. And he was a professor. His son became my best friend, and it was settings like this that he would take us to, and like with the college freshmen and the uh, sophomores. Uh, he would take us out of town to mm -hmm. settings like this with other young guys mm -hmm. and talk and, and have dialogue. And I, I, I remember those things so vividly because they were against the norm, you know. So as African-American men, we need a level of exposure outside of your own demographic, outside of your own neighborhood, outside of, you know, the people in the association that you're in. And mind you this. For us to be in this room discussing wealth. Now, another thing that I do is I, uh, I started a business called Wealth Creation Academy. Wealth Creation Academy is something that I started from a passion of mine because I watched my mother work three jobs, single parent, you know, not knowing my father as well. Um, and watch my mother work three jobs, you know, uh, and I can remember vividly her having to work on Christmas morning and crying like, you know, my mom's not here and I don't have no gifts under this tree. You know what I mean? This was in my teenage years. You know, we, we uh, as youth, there's a lot of peer pressure about your clothes and shoes and, mm -hmm. and different things like that and have to struggle with those things with your friends looking a certain type of way and you got holes in your shoes and you wear the same pants two or three times out the week and still watching your mom struggle you know, and go through certain challenges, you know, in the household. All of this right in North Richmond. So I grew up with this anger, like, why I got to struggle? Why we got to go through? Why my family got to suffer? You know, and, and it was just so difficult in my mind. And I had so much animosity against, like, my lifestyle at the time. So when I grew up and got of age, I said, I'm going to do everything within my power to get money. Now, some of that led me down the wrong road. Some of that made me have to make bad decisions because it wasn't just about getting money. You know, we hear music about it, we hear songs about it. Our African-American culture teaches us that it's about money, clothes, houses, and our music in and, and, and a lot of different ways. Not all of our culture, but most of the culture uh, that, that you guys see as you, it teaches you about money, houses, cars, women, and stuff like that. So I went that path at first. I went that path at first, and then I realized Having a lot of money and having those things didn't give me what I really needed. And that was freedom. And when I say freedom, I don't mean freedom from slavery, but I mean freedom to make a choice. To make a choice. Now, I own a car dealership and I got a lot of other businesses, but I chose to be here today and I can make that choice. I didn't have to answer to somebody and say, mm -hmm. can I get some time off? Uh, can I come in late? I have fought, uh, sacrificed for the power to choose what I want and the life that I want for my children, all right? So so I've done that not just by 
getting a lot of money. I've done that by educating myself on the power to choose. All right, so you guys, with, with what we're teaching and what we're explaining and the information that we're giving you, we want to position you so that you can have the power to choose what college you go to and don't have to settle because of GPA or lack of finances. We want to give you the power to choose on your, your, your future. We want you to give, uh, give you the power to choose for freedom, you know, um, and, and, and also empower you guys in the proper industries so that you can prosper. I know if I ask, everybody would probably say, hey, I want to, you know, maybe uh, play football or basketball and things like that. And that's great. Let's push you in that. But in the same token, with your plan A, have a plan B that's dealing with engineering, that's dealing with technology, that's dealing with science and math. This young man right here was blowing my mind. I just kept eating because he was asking some crazy questions <laughs> and they were good questions and I didn't have to answer them. You know, he was just shutting us down. He shut us down. But it was awesome. It was awesome because you can tell that throughout the dialogue that people have been educating themselves mm -hmm. outside of just sports. Now watch this. What's the what's the what's the uh, latest pair of Jordans that's out there right now? The twelve. Yeah. What's, say it again. The twelve. OG twelve. That's the old school one. They look like the the very first Jordans, right? Am I right? All right. How much are they? Two hundred. Two fifty. Two fifty. Right. Now I, my son's brother. My son. My oldest son is sixteen. Now, I didn't. I didn't buy him the twelves, but I did buy him a pair of Jordans. He works. I mean, he doesn't work, but he plays drums for the church that I pastor. Um, he works hard in his grades. He, he's a good kid. So I chose to buy it for him because I can afford it. Um, but I also told him that is, and I paid, they weren't 12, so it was like 190 or 185 or something like that. I sat him down, I put up on my phone, <clears throat> and I showed him because we were at DTLR. Um, and anybody know who owns DTLR? I'm going to get to that before I close. Um, African Americans don't, I'll tell you that much. We don't. We don't. But who did they service? They service our culture. Mm -hmm. But we don't own it. Okay? We don't own it. Jewish people own it. Not knocking them or throwing shade. I'm just exposing truth. Okay? It's nothing against them. They position themselves. They own it. And who dollars do they go after? Yours. So I was in detail a lot having a, a conversation with my son about wealth creation and how, yes, I don't have a problem spending $200 on a pair of shoes to you. But... Did you know how much a stock of Nike costs? One share of Nike. Say it louder for me. It's a little bit more. It's a little bit more. Last time I checked, it was like 146 bucks. All right? Jewish families at 13, they have a bar mitzvah for their young boys. And they teach these young boys about their history. And they tell them that your great-grandfather was a millionaire. And your grandfather was a multi-millionaire. And me, your father, speaking to you is a multi-multi-millionaire. So guess what you're going to be? You're going to be a multi-multi-multi-millionaire. You understand what I'm telling you? You're not going to go out here and buy a $200 pair of shoes. You're going to go out here and buy shares or stock in that company. We'll give you $30 shoes. We'll buy you $10 pair of pants and a $20 shirt. And we'll create an opportunity for you that you'll never have to impress nobody by how you look, but how you sound. Mm -hmm. and how well you speak. Mm -hmm. Because the people that are going to cut checks for you are not going to look at your feet first. Mm -hmm. They're going to look at what's coming out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. And I came from the inner city, and I've sat in boardrooms. I've had people write checks for $150,000 to go into my business. I've had these things to happen, and I couldn't go with $200 shoes. <laughs> I, I couldn't go with you know those type of things, you know what I mean, that, that impress each other. I wasn't trying to impress us. I was really trying to move our culture out of poverty into prosperity. Mm -hmm. I can bear witness with what he was saying because I've, 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 I've spoken, you know, to people and God has monetized. Anybody know what monetize means? Go ahead. I've made money off of my pain, my struggle, and what I've gone through. I used to be so ashamed that my mother had to struggle. I used to be so ashamed that I had to go through certain things. I did. I used to be so ashamed of my ultimate giving back to my community is my pastorship, you know, right here in the city. I don't, I don't look at that as a place that God monetizes me. But I've gotten up and smoking before people like yourselves, and God has given me back the things that I've given out, you know, in a number of different ways with beautiful family and kids, 
uh, through beautiful opportunities. It's not just all about the money. But guess what? The money will double back unto you when he sees that you're mature enough to handle it. You know, when he called me and said that, hey, I'm doing something for the kids, look, it wasn't about the money. It was about taking an opportunity and pouring into some young people like somebody poured into me. All right? And my life goal, my life passion is not to be a millionaire. I know what that feels like. I know what having businesses and selling businesses and making money feels like. You get to a, per, a, a certain point in your life where you say, you know what? It's not even about what I acquire. Mm -hmm. It's about what I give back. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and freedom is about what you give back. All right, Harriet Tubman, y'all know her, right? Harriet Tubman uh, was known for what? How? With the what? On the Grand Railroad, right? She made a statement. She made a statement. She said, I've set hundreds, if not thousands, of slaves free. She said, I've, set them, I, I've led them to freedom. But I would have saved, I would have led so many more to freedom if they only knew that they were slaves. So she had a fight. As much as we celebrate her, she didn't have a fight with just slave masters. She had a fight with her own kind, people that look just like her. With the mindset that of, I'd rather put it on, I'd rather be safe, I'd rather be comfortable than going to freedom. We're here not today to make you comfortable, we want to make you uncomfortable. So that you can start a revolution, not just of making money, but helping your generation make it to freedom. Financially, educationally, and personally. All right? I appreciate it. Get paid to speak. And when I say get paid to speak, anywhere for a great speaker on a minimum of fifty thousand dollars to speak, up to hundred thousand dollars for them to open their mouth and articulate. Now, um, the the reason why our culture is so, like I said, we have so much animosity one to another is because of mentality. Yeah. Your father has given you a platform of exposure that most don't have. And we sat here and attested like we didn't have that connecting from a male figure to give us that level of exposure. But you're getting exposed to entrepreneurship, you're also getting exposed to proper etiquette, behavior, and you already in your mind understand supply, demand, and how to be a wise steward and utilize your resources by saying, hey, $250, I can have X, Y, Z, A, B, C, one, two, three. While you're consumed and all your money is here, I can stretch my money here. That's a concept and a mentality that is a commodity. It's a gift. So what you have to realize is that you are gifted. You are talented. You are before your time. So you, as much as you get offended probably by how they treat you, what they really work. So keep the mindset that you have right now. Keep focusing on whatever music you like right now. Keep your mindset on the fact that you can get them 15 pair of shirts instead of one pair of shoes. Keep speaking the way that you speak, which is so eloquent, because you heard me speak about getting paid to speak, right? You heard the brother speak about getting paid to speak. Now, you think somebody will pay to speak if you can't even formulate words and say properly? Nobody want to hear that. It sounds good in high school. It sounds good amongst your peers. It's going to keep you black, keep you relevant, right? But you're not, you're not excelling in life. When you get older, he talked to me, he's a Toastmaster. He's talking to you about speaking. I'm speaking about speaking. He's speaking about speaking. All these things, and we're... Someone successful in our own right. You gotta know how to speak properly. And if you can start at your age now, you're gonna be phenomenal by the time you get to our age. A lot of us may not have even gotten to this point until we got well out of school. I was full of slang and bodies all through high school. That's all I spoke. You know what I mean? But imagine if you could be speaking the way you're speaking right now. You could probably do some speaking engagements right now. Right now at this man's church with me and connect with these people. So stay on that path. It's not gonna be easy. Everybody else around you speaking a different language. But you gotta you gotta change your mentality so that you stay focused on your future.